Looking around, the redhead finds herself standing in the middle of a dark and damp forest. But despite the gentle waves of the breeze moving the flora, there's no sound. To the Terran's recognising eye as well, the plant life appears to be a blending mingle of those on the Grat homeworld and the faithful operation on the Wister owned world. Moving forward, her surprisingly lucid mind comes to the conclusion that she is once again dreaming, though Dow being brought on by the growth in her brain case. She finds her loose path reminiscent of an overgrown hunter's trail that snakes her deeper into the silent landscape. Although something instinctual in her demands to be fearful of the situation, Simone can't help to be more curious than anything, due to the fact this hasn't happened in a little while. After some time of traversing the blending path, she catches something glinting off past nearby foliage. Freezing for a moment, she stares it down in an attempt to make out what it is. When it proves to not be a barrel of a weapon, she approaches it and reaches out. Her bare hand touches the glint, causing it to fully take form before resting in her palm. In a light duck, she draws the dangling object free from a thin branch, and brings it up close to her face. On a thin necklace chain is a bent dog tag and a small grimy triangular device. Manipulating the tag, Simone is not at all surprised to find her own name on it. But as for the device, she surmises that it's very similar to the thing implanted to her forehead after being kidnapped by the children of Gaia, though clearly a differing model with possibly a very different purpose. For a moment, Simone is almost compelled to put the triangle to her head, but knowing better than to trust the bits of a Minarian mad scientist in her brain, she resists and decides to continue down the path. But to her concern, the path is no longer there when she turns around. Instead, before her is a cliffside, overlooking a wide field of absolute chaos. Down in the valley she overlooks is an expanse of a visceral battle playing out. No longer silent, the explosions and cries of vocals are significantly muffled, as if her own hearing was going out. Still, she steps closer to the drop to get a fuller view. Far down below, yet in perfect clarity to her dream eyes, are various sized armies of every known species defending incoming forces from the dark encircling tree line. From the trees themselves are lines of armoured Minarians consistently pressing more and more into the valley. From all sides, the defenders are overwhelmed from their foes. Few Minarians drop in their compressing march. Simone witnesses that, as they approach individuals of other species, the defenders throw down their arms before kneeling in surrender. Like an aura of instant submission, those who don't fall in battle give in to the invaders in an instant. More and more, the Minarians gain ground, only seeming to slow as death orders put up the most fight. Finding the location of the Terrans, Simone's heart sinks. A small but effective population is fighting against the bulk within their own lines. Disarray ensues as the Terrans divide their bewildered attention from within and what approaches, unable to give support to others or eventually themselves. Suddenly, the majority of the Kali forces turn to their neighbouring species and join in on the Venerian side. In the midst of this, they release a devastating additional army of Malkite that help carve the Minarians an easy path towards the most united and powerful section of the defenders. In mere moments, Central falls, sending a cascading wave of despair to all the remaining defenders. Before the Minarians even get close now, swarms of species begin to surrender, seeing their best chance of maintaining a defence is obliterated. Thankfully, the Terrans are seen to have taken care of the internal conflict, but unfortunately it's far too late for it to matter, as they practically stand alone in this fight. Some species flee to bolster and hide behind the Terrans' lines. To their credit, if not for a moment, they fight back hard enough to pause the Minarian advance. There's moments of grim yet heroic sacrifices, ground freely given in order to lure the enemy into effective traps and some Terrans manage to not give in to the aura of submission long enough for others to run. It's damn inspiring to see the unstoppable force stall. But of course, it's not enough. Lines break, encampments burn, leaders fall. 
Eventually, Terrans are reduced to a single, circular formation, as they stand shoulder to shoulder in defense of the little they have left. They hold until their ammunition and other supplies run dry. Expecting surrender, the Manarians extend the option to stop the fighting, then and there. In a moment of consideration, the Terrans, under the flag of their last standing leader, charge outwards in a hopeless to find melee. The fighting is visceral and brutal, but eventually only one Terran stands against an entire universe. The individual has no energy left to strike out. In their grasp is a tattered and burnt flag that can no longer be made out. But the Terran stands, using it as a brace. A Manarian leader comes up and hammers the final Terran to the ground, demanding submission. A few now utterly silent moments pass by before the Terran drags themselves up the flagpole into a standing position. With another blow, the Manarian strikes them down again. But the Terran refuses and gets up once more. Having run out of patience, the Manarian shoots a leg cleanly free from the Terran. Yet with a scream, they remain standing, utilizing the pole even more. Deciding that it's no longer worth trying, the aggressor levels their weapon to the Terran's face. Just before being vanquished for good, Simone realises that, through the cracked open helmet of the Terran, that they were looking straight up at her. Despite the distance, the two sets of eyes locked together. There is not pleading in the wounded Terran's eyes. No fear. No judgement. Nothing Simone would ever expect. What the redhead sees in them can only be expressed in one simple word. Hope. As the final shot sings out, the valley is encompassed in shadow, resembling more of a massive endless pit. I know it's a stake. Why am I being shown this? You of all people should be elated that this is coming. Simone thinks, for Shara to possibly pick up. But instead of an expected occurrence, she feels a warmth from behind her. Turning her back from the void, she immediately sees a small campsite. There's a tent, a stack of scavenged firewood, and a strange cliché knight sitting on a log by a roaring fire. Feeling her heart skip a beat, Simone practically runs to him, expecting it to be an aspect of her father. But she soon realises that the person's frame is far too small to be an avatar of him. Noticing her, the armoured individual raises a hand in greeting before staring at the fire. The area behind their visor still pitch dark. What is this? Simone sceptically says in her mind, not trusting this in the slightest. The knight then speaks up. A fire, they say. I mean, all of this. What's going on? The Terran presses. You're dreaming. And thus your mind is moulding things in the manner minds do when slumbering. The knight states. Okay. So what are you supposed to be? Because with what's going on with my head, a lot of things I dream are actually literal things affecting me. Like you actually answering my question so directly is pretty suspicious. This, uh, Shara thing? Usually it's my dad in the night get up. So what are you? Simone responds in questioning. Nothing of substance at all. Or something vitally important. That's really up for you to decide, really. This is your mind, after all. I'm simply here because your mind thought it necessary to conjure me. The knight replies. But this isn't how dreams are normally supposed to work. Even more lucid ones, right? This is getting real fucking weird, the redhead argues. Then perhaps your mind's ailment is affecting your mind quite a bit, the knight shrugs. No fucking kidding, Simone agrees, as she steps up closer. So, you wouldn't know where I can talk with whatever's left of Shara? To answer this, the knight bends to the side and digs their hand into loose soil. Sitting back up, they begin to massage it back out to the forest floor. Bits and pieces everywhere. Constantly trying to pull together, but is simply unable to be whole. And destined to eventually drive you mad, they explain. Wait, what? How? Simone asks. You have been affected by her unconsciously, have you not? Wanting to viciously bite your lover, speaking in her tongue, the symptoms of her gradually melting into you. Although she's not complete, you will eventually start to forget who you really are. To mind sharing one consciousness, 
It spells disaster for Simone Thatch. I suggest you find a way to avoid this. But Vermis told me that she's far too gone to be a problem, the redhead points out. She can't take your body from you, but she'll still seep. Regardless if she can even intend to or not, your mind will survive, but your identity will slip to some degree. Shit, Simone responds, as she plants her face to her hands. So, you're part of my subconscious that is telling me something is wrong. Possibly. Makes sense if that's the case, the knight grants, as Simone can hear the helmet be removed from the individual. She attempts to pull her hands away, only to realise she was stuck in this room of pitch black. Simone's eyes opened from what was meant to just be a brief nap. Her brain was foggy, and the details of her dream was loose enough to question her actual lucidity, during or if her dream simply tricked her into thinking she was in fact lucid. Rubbing her face, she sits up to see Chuck having a conversation with Sonla across the hotel room. Hey, hun, how long was I out? She asks, as she swings her legs off the side of the bed. The princess stands up and begins moving over to the Terran. Just a few hours. I was planning on waking you in another hour anyway, so don't fret. You really needed it after everything, Chuck replies with a giggle, as she reaches out to address her lover's bedhead fur. Allowing the Kelly to fix what she can, Simone sighs out of soreness. Yeah, I did, she agrees in a chuckle. Our new infiltrator caught up to speed? I haven't shared certain details, but she knows that we are perhaps going to have a less than legal encounter with the Terran president. That won't harm the president, hopefully, Chuck reports, before finishing up with the Terran's fur. Oh, and I purchased some new clothes for you to wear on our trip back. They were delivered not a standard half hour ago. Simple pants and shirt. Your dress has been cleaned and repaired as well, she notified as she pointed to the closet area. Simone leans out and kisses the Kelly in a tender peck. You're the best, hun, she whispers, before standing up and stretching out the ache, before striding over to the neatly folded pile of clothes. Only a second to you, Chuck Quaddy replies, as she enjoys the view for a few moments before snapping to it. I'll have our transport summoned. Before the three can even depart out the front door, as the elevator door opens, there's a crowd of people waiting for them in the lobby. Simone opens her mouth to ask what was going on, but Chuck swiftly presses the indicator to reclose the door. Chuck Latimotas, uh, one moment of your time. Princess, there's some questions regarding public property damage. When was the last correspondence you had with your father? Is the Terran really your fiancé, or a roleplay consort? Among other raising voices upon seeing the Cali, the reporter sworn towards the elevator, just before the door closed and started to go up a level. Wow, Simone utters. I thought we'd be a bit more shielded from them. If they reserve rooms at the hotel after learning we were here, then there's not much that can be done, Chuck replies a bit troubled. We just need to find another way. As the door opens again, even more people stand and wait. Oh, Princess, was your appearance on Frobo, the True Fools podcast, really you, or did you use AI to replicate your voice? Wasn't you present on Kamoi, roughly a standard year ago, when a restaurant was destroyed in a terrorist attack? Were you the target? What business do you have in Central? Are you going to appeal to have your father's authority be unrecognised? Have you spoken at all to the Kelly Ambassador? Care to share any details over the events that transpired with Ambassador Shrek's son last night? Is the Farouk also a lover of yours? Is your chitin really deep dyed? Are you still in fear for your life? Are Terrans... The elevator door sealed again, this time needing Simone to hold back people from potentially creeping into the elevator. I guess we're going back down to make a run for it, Simone hops in immense annoyance. Unfortunately, that appears to be our only option, Chuck nods, her patience being tested as well. Want me to make a big explosion as a distraction? Solar offers. No need for that, Chuck replies quickly. Here, I'll march us out. Solar, get on my back, Simone says before she kneels down and scoops up the Kelly in her arms. Still as light as a feather, she winks. Chuck's eyes flash. They'll be given quite the show, she chuckles. As told, Sonda clambers up the back of the Terran and gets a firm hold around her neck. If an explosion is needed, I'm ready, she declares, just before the doors open for the final time. 
Using her cradling arm onto the Kelly's back, Simone uses her curled up hand to protect Chuck's head as she marches straight into the crowd. None wanting to test to see if the bulky Terran considers trembling a valid option, a path is cleared. However, the barrage of questions does not let up in the slightest as they follow the trio towards the front doors. What was the intention of your stay here? When and where will your wedding to the Terran occur? Is it true that Simone Thatch is a war criminal? Have you suffered any injury while being intimate with a Terran? How many Terrans have you mated with? Are all the ones you brought with you your harem? Are you certain that you are the last survivor of your family? Are the crack to be trusted? Have you encountered any bounty hunters in Central? Is the famed Admiral Chuknook still in your service? Have you been hiding out this whole time on Vepulperna? Are you planning on commencing a civil war? How much are you paying the Terran to be your mate? To the dismay of Chuck and Simone, the crowd only grew upon leaving the hotel's premises, and even contributed around where their shuttle was landing. Although not completely serious about it, Simone started to humour the idea of Sonla causing a distraction, before sharp roaring barks erupts from nearby. The questions all stop, and even a few calls of distress ring out as everyone catches sight of a dozen uniformed Zartux approach. In a wildlife formation, they release warning, though no doubt perceived as outright threatening vocalizations. More cries ring out as they unleash fur covered mammalian quadrupeds that run ahead to the trio and begin guiding the reporters away through fear alone. Simone couldn't help but laugh aloud at the sight of the Terran shepherd dogs doing what their breed did best. A trompel recalls impelled terror as they worm away from one of the canines, who did nothing but exist with an authoritative attitude. Very effectively parting the crowd away from the three, the lead Zar took waves Simone to come to her. Seeing little reason not to, considering the rescue, the Terran nods and hurries the two other women on her to the line of dinos. Thanks, but what's this about? she asks. The pack of a dozen dinos encircle the three and start walking them away to another shuttle landing zone. The dogs loyally come back to their owners as they make sufficient distance. As an apology for you having to get involved with last night's events, Ambassador Zrek wishes to personally escort you back to your designated apartment, she answers, as three shuttles await them in the zone. The biggest and most armoured of which opens up for the three to enter. Ow, Chuck utters in thought, before Simone lets her down to enter the vessel. As the princess steps on in, it's clear this vessel is meant to fit many guests within on a regular basis, considering the scuffing and scratch marks. But at this moment, there is only one individual within. Looking much like his son, Zrik is of the larger variant of his species. Covered in various deep scars across his scales, and adorned in high quality drapery, he pets a smaller breed of dog in his lap. Thank you for accepting my invitation, princess, he greets, with a respectful bow of his head. Of course, we very much appreciate your assistance with the media swarm, Chuck replies, before she finds herself a seat. You can get off now, Simone informs Sonla, before following the Kelly in. The Varuk slowly slides down the Terran, and does her best to position herself to hide behind the redhead as much as possible eventually sitting down in a seat that has the larger frame of the Terran between her and the Ambassador. Simone looks the Ambassador in the eyes with a hint of weariness. Although she isn't necessarily suspicious, with the still very significant bounty on her fiancé's head, one can never be too careful. She waits until the seal of the shuttle door clicks shut, before speaking up herself. Cute Corgi, does it have a name? she inquires. <clears throat> the Zartuk hums in amusement as he lightly scratches the canine on his rump, causing it to lift his head and perk its ears. His name is Yoka. A play on the Zartuk title, meaning one who has seen the abyss and made it weep. Such a title is usually reserved for artists or passionate leaders, people who can invoke a great shift of public morale, whether it be for sorrow, fear, or hope. This dog, although he is in no small part of my public image, he has shifted my morale extraordinarily he answers, in a relatively reminiscing voice. Seeing his genuine soft appreciation for the animal is clear as date to Simone. She allows herself to relax as the shuttle takes off with two additional escorts. Dogs are pretty great, huh? 
Simone chuckles. Possibly the best of everything your people have brought to the stars, the man agrees. Despite losing a long war with Terrans, our talk certainly gained from it in some aspects. Crazy how that hashes out. And hey, more dogs in the universe? I'll take it, the redhead replies, before peeking over to Sonla, who is tucking her legs up to make her silhouette smaller. Ow, oh, how is your son faring, Ambassador Zrik, and the others in his and his wife's company? Chuck asks pleasantly. He has been advised to be in bed for a few days, but will make a full recovery. The others will recover as well, but those more substantially injured will of course need a fair bit more recovery. That's very good to hear. Be sure to pass along our best wishes, the princess replies, with a nod of her head. I will. Though I must apologise for your involvement in his incident. Such business should have been avoided in the first place, Zreek says, as he extends one of his hands out to Chuck, which he accepts sooner than he would have expected from Akali. Thank you for the gesture. The involvement was voluntary, I assure you. Believe it or not, Ambassador, I have conducted myself in more perilous situations, as you can no doubt imagine, Chuck says pleasantly. Though I have a feeling you brought us aboard your own personal shuttle with other motors in mind, yes? Simone tenses up again, as the ambassador's raptor eyes focuses on the princess for a moment. Tilting his horned head, Zrig then lets out a caught me red handed snicker, before pulling his hand away. Yes, yes, all right indeed. Though I assure you it has little to do with the price on your head. As much as I still enjoy a good hunt, I'm not one to prey upon my own allies. No. What I hope to discuss is ensuring you are reinstated as the prime monarch of the Kali people, he reveals. Ow, oh, pardon, Drake. What exactly do you mean by that? Chuck asks, as she recovers from such a bold notion. I've decided to place my bets on you, Chocolata Motaz. I bring you an offer already officiated over by my people's leaders for you to respond. May I officially present it to you in this rather unofficial setting? He inquires. Very well, but I cannot make a promise that I'll be receptive to what you offer, Chuck grants, as she crosses her lower limbs in her lap. Zreek presses an indication in a side data pad, activating a hard light screen to appear along the middle open area of the shuttle. The text on the screen outlines the terms of the proposal, to which the ambassador presents it aloud. This proposed bargain has been rattling around the Zatuk trade leaders since the coup of your father. Though it hinged on whether or not you or any of your siblings survived, Seeing you are indeed alive and making concerted efforts towards freeing your people from his tyrannical rule, one way or another, you fit the criteria. And so here it is. The Zartuk conglomerate will publicly support your right to the Kali throne, and it is prepared to dedicate one sixth of its war fleets and the third Fang battalion to aid in the likely event of a military conflict. He pauses to let that settle before continuing. In return, the conglomerate requests that the Kali government agree to contribute 10% more natural grey product and 25% more clone grey product to the Zartuk meat market trade for the next 50 standard year period. Secondly, it is also requested that Kali shipyards produce 2,500 trade ships by conglomerate provided specifications in the next five standard years. Thirdly, permit Zartuk trade businesses to set up shop on Kali colonies. Fourth and finally, Vote and publicly advocate for the Zartuk people to be officiated out of associate species into member species status in Central, he finishes. Chuck scratches the sides of her head with her lower graspers, as she seriously considers the alliance deal. It's an incredible opportunity. With the Zartuk's big economic pull among the carnivorous species of Central, despite them currently being of associate status, this could be very advantageous. But the cost for the support was fairly high, yet not totally unreasonable. Your offer is rather tempting, Ambassador, though I cannot see myself agreeing to it as it stands. You see, if open civil war does break out, then I fear my people will need a period of time to stabilise, especially economically. People will need to be fed, buildings rebuilt, and damage to our world repaired, so here's my counteroffer for your consideration, she says as she reaches out in request for the datapad, of which is candidly handed to her for her to revise the terms for consideration. Lower the 25% for cloned product to 20, 
provide charitable relief shelter camps where displaced Kelly can be warm and well fed during the war campaign, which may prove to be a great source of building up positive relations with not only my people but many other sitting in member central seats, and finally agree to grant Kelly trade ships official access to conglomerate trade routes with reduced fines by 30%. The rest of your terms are acceptable, she responds. Hmm, Zhrik mumbles as he stares at the screen. He brings a claw to his arm and muzzle, dragging it along a deep old scarring. I have the authority to negotiate the terms within reason, and although I know a few trade managers will be disgruntled, I believe your counterterms are acceptable, he nods, before transferring the developed agreement to the datapad, for both parties to sign. The Tsar took signs first, before handing the pad over. Suppressing her eyes from blasting light, to not give away how she honestly felt about this deal, Chuck re-reads the entire agreement twice, to make absolutely certain that there are no possible term manipulations. The Tsar Took are known to be honourable in terms of business, but one can never be too careful in this realm of dealing. Once she is certain of all the terms, Chuck signs as well, and hands it back. Your gamble on me is appreciated, Ambassador. I will do everything in my power to ensure that my father is deposed, with your aid, I see the path towards that even more clearer, she assures. Time will tell, and to be honest we stand to lose little until conflict is certain. The biggest risk we run is a prolonged open war with the Kali. Central history is not kind to death orders declaring war on non-death orders. Even under these circumstances, we may risk being ousted completely from Central. Though I'm doubtful considering our stranglehold on the meat markets. Who else would they turn to? The Truba? With their reputation and recent enormous debacle, I don't think so, Zrick chuckles, as he returns to petting his lapdog. Such a travesty, Chuck agrees. Is there more you can share regarding that situation? Just that these Squilla understandably don't have much of a government. They dwelled in deeper waters and complex cave systems in their comparative Iron Age. They are incredibly fast learners, however which gives most of the Central Council the impression that the Trooper have been suppressing the Squillers' growth as a people for literal ages. I don't think anything like this has ever happened in known galactic history. It's still all a mess, unfortunately, but important first steps have been taken. I've spoken to the representative of the Squiller only a few times, and seen him come to terms with reality is bittersweet, the ambassador explained. I see. Perhaps I may have a chance to meet him while I'm in Central, Chuck says with a shrug. It's a long line to privately meet in an official manner, which is to no surprise, I assume, Zrik informs. Of course. Perhaps not, then, Chuck concedes. Wide-eyed, Simone looks back and forth between the two. Sorry, um, I feel like what just happened earlier is a pretty big fucking deal. Military support? Not that I'm complaining, but I'd imagine something like that having a bit more bureaucracy. A quick back and forth and it's a done deal, she questioned, utterly bewildered. This is how backroom deals tend to go, Simone. You know that, Chuck replies, as she reaches a hand to take hold of one of the redheads. She then squeezes in trembling excitement to show that she was putting up a polite professional act. Right, yeah, Simone corrects herself, as she huffs a pant of jubilated air. The ambassador turns to look at the Terran directly. Simone Thatch, if you're at liberty to confirm... Through some dealings we have received interesting intel regarding a Terran group that calls itself the Children of Gaia. Have you encountered them previously? He inquires. Ah, uh, um, I know about them. But that's all I'm really willing to share at this time. What sort of dealings are you referring to, exactly? The Terran responds. Nothing nefarious, at least at the surface. We have traded a strange breeze of dogs, tracing their origins to that group. We suspect that they are these pirates that invaded the Grat homeworld, would that be correct? Zreek presses, now looking back and forth between the Terran and Kali. Chuck sighs, but nods. That would be correct, she admits. Why hide that fact? The ambassador asks. Well, there's a reason to, and I'm afraid we can't share why, but rest assured their identity will be broadly revealed in due time. Soon if we can help it, but we have to secure a few things first, Chuck explains. Apologies for withholding information from you, but I ask that the conglomerate not share intel of the group for the time being, Chuck requests. I can't promise such, but if it's in your interest to wait, then it is likely ours as well, Zreek grants. 
But if we found what we have, others are likely to as well. So I hope whatever you are planning comes around soon, Princess, he adds. As do I. And trust me, I understand, Chuck says, as she squeezes Simone's hand once more. They are our enemies, and what we intend to do is dismantle them, she assures. Ah, uh, I hope you don't mind a single stop before arriving at your apartment. I have a gift that I wish to present to you, Zrik announces, after he seems to have received a notification on his lens. Oh, how kind of you. What manner of gift? Chuck inquires. One that in some small way may bolster your personal security, the ambassador vaguely answered, a bit quaily. Oh joy, Simone says, unsure if they'd be able to comfortably take on another staff member on the quip chat. Soaring down into a tight one-way entrance tunnel, the shuttle eventually comes to a latching stop before being lifted up into an unloading room. Come, step out, it's being brought to us. Zreek instructs, as he stands and strides out. Preparing themselves to politely turn his offer down, Simone and Chuck step out after him. Sondler, on the other hand, decided then would be a perfect time to raid the fancy meat snack she'd been eyeing for most of the trip. As the three stand just outside the shuttle and wait, it takes only a few minutes for a Jartuk to turn a corner and enter the room. Unfortunately, I don't think we'll have room to properly accommodate, Chuck begins to say before feeling her legs freeze up in sudden numbness as a beast comes trailing behind the Zartuk. Simone's eye tuss lifts in surprise as she looks upon what she initially mistakes as a damn hyena as it shares the rusty red-brown colour, stripes, and even a shallow mohawk of longer fur going down its back. Though its pitbull-esque face and body structure clues her in that it is indeed a dog. The thickly muscled domestic canine Assertively pats its claw paws across the floor towards them, passing up the handler as it stopped and politely sat ten feet away. Bending down, Zrik sets down his corgi, which without hesitation stamps quickly over to the comparatively titanless brethren. Sniffing up and around his new friend, the loaf of a dog ran a circle around the other unbothered canine before splaying forward in a play pose in front of it, before then running off as if to invite a chase. Her name is Room, meaning well of fangs and talons. She is only two years of age, but understands commands and galactic standard, and is perfectly trained to guard her charge with her life, Shriek introduced, before notifying the uncertain fright in the princess. She is also trained to assist as an emotional support companion. She can provide more service-oriented work, but that hasn't been a primary focus of her training. I thought that may suit someone of your nature, princess, he added, before addressing the dog directly. Room at ease. The dog's ice-blue eyes spark with hyper-excitement as she breaks her statue pose to spaz out before engaging in play with the corgi, sniffing him in return greeting after easily catching up. She isn't the best I can offer, but I believe she'd be perfect for you. May she approach to meet you? The ambassador inquires. Um, Chuck utters, before looking up to Simone for an opinion. Biting her cheek, the redhead gives a tentative nod back. Ow, oh, all right, the princess agrees. Room, come, Zrik instructs. Turning away and all but ignoring the corgi again, Zoom approaches much closer to the free. Her circular blue eyes look up at the ambassador loyally, only taking side glances at the two women. Transfer, the Zartuk commands, as he points to Chuck first, and then to Simone. The head of the dog looked up at Chuck, his head pretty much as large as hers. D do I pet her? Chuck inquires. Of course. Now I strongly recommend that you limit her social interaction to a minimum when she's on the job. When she's off, tell her at ease so she knows. Shriek answers with an amused but serious tone. Uh, okay. Hello, Shroom. Um, at ease? At ease, Chuck says directly to the animal. Shroom sinks her head slightly forward to gently press against between the Kali's lower arms. Looking up with her crisp blues, she starts to work her tail and lightly stamps her front paws. Chuck's racing heart starts to relax as a familiar admiration feeling rises up within her. Glancing up at Simone, she caught her inwardly biting her lips to resist the broad smile from breaking out. Looking back at the dog, 
Chuck lifts all of her limbs and begins scritching at the places that she saw these animals enjoy in the media. Behind the ears, under the chin, and the size of the thick neck. Shroom closes her eyes as her tail aggressively pats against the floor like a happy baton. And Chuck swears the dog's closed mouth smiled, though that could have been a trick to the angle she is viewing her. What do you think? The ambassador asks, seeming to already know the answer. She's so sweet, Chuck replies in a giggle. I don't think I can say no. Then in that case, I'll have her supplies looted up for you.